So for today, I think we, so today it's a very uh, pretty low key uh, session. Uh, we have uh, workflow scripts, uh, which was a very small chapter on how to work around scripts. And then we have half of the exercises on exploratory data analysis, uh, which we will uh, talk about how to <clears throat> look for, uh, you know, correlations and patterns uh, in a data set. Uh, so to start with, I'll quickly go through the uh, scripts chapter. Uh, it's pretty uh, basic, actually. It talks about how we should use scripts instead of the console to uh, write uh, longer codes. And it talks about a couple of shortcuts on how to uh, how to run uh, commands. So it, it, it first talks about control enter or command uh, and enter uh, to run a particular line or a chunk of lines. Uh, and what happens is that when we press control and enter, uh, it runs the uh, current set of codes and then the cursor goes to the next uh, line, which is uh, pretty convenient. Uh, it also uh, talks about control plus shift plus S, which is a shortcut to run the entire script uh, instead of running uh, one chunk at a time. So this is very helpful too. <clears throat> Uh, in addition to these two, I think uh, what I also use at times is uh, Control Shift and N, uh, which is so if you if we are uh, say in this chunk and we want to run the next chunk, uh, we can do Control Shift and N, which uh oh no, not Control Shift and N. Uh, was it Control N? Ah, I forgot. Never mind. Uh, so basically it was a shortcut to run the next batch of uh, the next chunk basically yeah it's uh, control alt n yeah so control alt n uh, runs the next chunk from the chunk that we are at so here i'm doing control shift enter which runs this whole chunk and then uh from here if i do a uh, Control Alt and N, it runs the next set of codes, which is could be sometimes useful. Uh, these were the these were a couple of shortcuts to uh, navigate the script, and then uh, it had a tip on R Studio Diagnostics. So uh, within a script, if we have any error, we can hover around that uh, red underlined area, and R Studio would come up with, uh, I don't know if this would throw up an error or not. Uh, but yeah, RStudio would come up with a, a pop-up message to suggest what's wrong. For example, here, uh, in this example, uh, there's an unexpected token, uh, which which is which is in the code. So these tips could be useful for us while we you know work with larger scripts. So that's all in the scripts chapter. We can, if there are any other uh, comments or thoughts, we can we can uh, talk about that. Or uh, if not, we can move to the exploratory data analysis section. Any thoughts, anyone? All right. Uh, so moving on. Uh, the next chapter is the exploratory data analysis uh, section where uh, uh, the chapter talks about, uh, you know, what is a variable, what are values, what is an observation, what is tab table data and what's tidy data. So that's pretty uh, basic. Uh, the first uh, suggestion that the authors have is to uh, visualize distribution while doing exploratory data analysis. And there are a couple of ways that we can do that depending on what kind of a variable we are dealing with. Uh, so for example, if we have a categorical variable like uh, the cut variable within diamonds, uh, we can uh, create a geom uh, bar. Uh, as we remember from our data visualization exercise geom bar, uh, does nothing but to count the number of values that are there within a category and uh, plots them, you know, in a bar chart. 
So in this particular example, what we see is uh, the number of uh, times or the number of uh, diamonds that are fair, good, very good, premium or ideal uh, category. Uh, so that's what Geom Bard does. And this is a good way to look at the distribution when we have a categorical variable. Uh, however, our variable might be continuous, uh, in which case, uh, for example, carrot, uh, if we look at carrot, it's the uh, carrot size of uh, the diamonds in the observation, uh, which is, a which is uh, entered as a continuous variable. Uh, in this case, uh, using a histogram is especially useful. So we look at the entire distribution and see if there's anything wrong, if there are any outliers and stuff like that. Uh, uh, that is That was about histograms. There was a really cool uh, way to uh, do the same thing, uh, which was by using geom underscore uh, freak poly. Uh, so for example, when we developed a histogram for uh, carrots, uh, it, it it basically gave us a count of uh, uh, count of diamonds uh, or count of observations for each bin width of carrot. Uh, what we can also do is to uh, use freak plot and uh, uh, use it with another categorical variable. So here. Uh, carrot is our uh, is in the x-axis and cut is uh, this another categorical variable and uh, uh, freak poly is essentially creating a polygraph kind of a thing with uh, uh, for for different levels of the cut variable which is which is very interesting and it uh, it's it comes along in one of the exercises I believe so we'll, we'll get a hands-on experience of that um, Apart from that, uh, the chapter talks a little bit about, uh, you know, detecting unusual values or outliers and uh, provides a couple of uh, tips on how to uh, identify outliers. For example, uh, here the authors again use the diamonds data set and uh, there's a variable called Y uh, in the data set, which is a continuous variable, I believe. Yeah, it's a continuous variable called Y. So uh, when a histogram is created for this particular variable, we see that the x-axis has a huge range, uh, uh, while most of the observations uh, seem to be ending within uh, 10. So what is happening here is that there are a couple of values which, are, which have a very high uh, value of x. And to detect that, uh, the authors say that uh, Quad underscore Cartesian is a good function, which uh, kind of provides a limit. Uh, uh, so, uh, so in fact, what is happening here is that since the y-axis is huge, since it's twelve thousand, uh, very small values of x might not, very small values of y might not be, you know, very visible uh, uh, when we when we see a graph like this. But if we limit the y-axis to say zero to fifty. Uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the outliers become start becoming visible. So here we had an outlier which which was you know which which probably had zero or one as as as, as the value of y. Uh, so these values start becoming visible, and uh, this way it's easier for us to uh, identify outliers. Uh, with that, we move to the first set of exercises. Uh, the first question was. Uh, to explore the distribution of each x, y, and z variables in the diamonds data set, what do we learn, uh, and how can we say which one is a length, width, and depth? Uh, so here I ex do exactly the same thing. Uh, I use uh, uh, ggplot with uh, x as the x-axis variable, and I, I mention point one as the uh, pin width. Uh, uh, and I also use a y limit for for quad underscore Cartesian. So uh, this allows us to uh, see that there are a couple of uh, you know zero entries. So this essentially means that here uh, there are about ten uh, observations where the x value is zero. Now x is one of you know length, width, and depth. Uh, so x cannot be zero. So so the length of a diamond or the 
or the width of a diamond or the depth of a diamond cannot be zero. So this uh, essentially tells us that there are about 10 observations or, or around eight observations that uh, have an invalid value of uh, for, for this variable X. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a good way for us to identify, uh, you know, errors in our uh, data set. Uh, we also see that uh, we have uh, a couple of outliers. Uh, so here there's, there's a couple of uh, counts probably where the value of X is very high. Uh, similarly, we work with the Y variable. Uh, when we run it without the quad underscore Cartesian function, we see that, uh, you know, this is how, so we have very high, very high number of uh, cases with a low value of Y. Uh, but then since the X axis goes way beyond, uh, you know, a 10 where the, where the graph seems to end, uh, we, we, we might assume that there, there could be, um, outliers and we try to zoom into the outliers by providing a limit to the core, uh, to the Cartesian coordinates. And this is uh, exactly how it is useful. So when we apply a limit to the y-axis, uh, we see that uh, for for this variable again, there are a lot of uh, there are quite a few cases where uh, we have uh, zero as the value of y. Uh, we also have quite a number of outliers right here uh, in say x equal to thirty two or x equal to 58 or something like that. So we have quite a, quite a few outliers there, uh, but the majority of the data set is falling uh, in this region right here. Um, finally, we also look at the Z variable and we see that uh, there are about 20 cases with, uh, with uh, zero value for Z, which is also, which is again, not uh, feasible. Uh, and then we have a couple of values here with, uh, with a very high value for Z, which is also odd and, uh, we should probably explore that or probe into that as to why that error happened. Uh, so that's, so the next, so that, that was pretty clear to me, but the next part of the question was, uh, you know, what do you learn? Think about the diamond and how you might decide which dimension is length, width, and depth. So this is something I, I could not figure out if, if anyone has any thoughts, uh, that would be really great. Uh, because I, 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 I don't know how to figure out which one is the length, width and depth, depending on, uh, these initial explorations. Any thoughts, anyone? Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's something that we might want to figure out later. Uh, and then we move to the next question in the exercise, which is, uh, which was to explore the distribution of price. Uh, did you discover anything unusual or surprising? Uh, and there's a hint. So, uh, we look at the diamonds data set, we take a glimpse, uh, and we see that price is a continuous variable. Uh, and, uh, we then try to look at, uh, the histogram plots, uh, with varying bandwidths. So the first bandwidth is, uh, so the first, uh, bin width, uh, my apologies, uh, bin width is 10. Uh, and here we see that, uh, it's a pretty, uh, skewed graph with, uh, this white, uh, area with potentially no values in it. Uh, so we want to zoom into that, uh, for which we change the bin width from 10 to hundred. And, uh, that kind of expands that gap, uh, a little bit more, uh, there's no other unusual gap, uh, anywhere else in the distribution. Uh, so this is really interesting. So, so we, uh, kind of want to zoom into that a little bit, uh, more, uh, we take a bin width, we, we increase our bin width from uh, 100 to 1000. Uh, 1000 is too big. Uh, by doing 1000, we kind of uh, uh, lose that gap because the bin width are really huge and the, and the gap uh, might be for a lower value of uh, the bin width. Uh, 500 also doesn't do us any good. Uh, we 
we'll try 200 200 also doesn't do any good so we switch back to uh a bin width of say 100 or lower 50 is 50 is pretty good so at 50 we see that there is there's this gap and now uh if we want to zoom into that gap uh we can use the quad underscore cartesian function to kind of limit the x-axis between 1000 and 2000 and uh, this is what we get uh so so this is uh the same histogram the only difference is that the x-axis now ranges from a thousand to two thousand the others are kind of curtailed from our view and uh the bin width that we have set is 50. uh so this kind this graph kind of tells us that uh there's uh and there are no observations where the price of a diamond is between uh 1450 to 1550 uh which is very unusual very weird i don't know why this is this is uh the case uh but uh the in the the uh, i mean zooming into the distribution we see that there's there's nothing no diamond that is priced between 1450 and 1550 uh anybody has any any clues uh on how to uh explore this further maybe or why this might be happening Okay, um, so that's that's another question that I had. If anyone has any thoughts, uh, that would be great. Um, yeah. Uh, next, I think we move on to the third question, which was uh, how many diamonds are 0.99 carat and how many are one carat. Uh, what do you think is the cause of the difference? Um, to do this, I think we again go back to the glimpse. We see that. Carrot is uh, sorry, Arna. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. No, 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 go for it. Okay, uh, so in the previous example, you said that there are no diamonds which has price between 1450 to 1550. Yeah, that's what it okay. seems like. Mm -hmm. But I could see some diamonds with price for 1451. And hmm. Okay, there are like, for all. Yeah, ah, 14. there are actually. Yeah, okay, okay, so it's not, sorry, it's not exactly 1450. Okay, I think you took this 1450 value as approximate, right? Looking at the plot. Yeah, 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 that was approximate. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. Something. Because the value is around, I think, 1454 till 1454. We don't have anything after 1454. I see. Let's actually, I'm actually uh, doing this actually. Nice. Yeah, you're right. Uh, it, yeah, it's 1450. This also 1459, but I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Okay, but yeah, very strange, right? Uh, yeah. After 1459, there's nothing till 1550, at least. Weird. Don't know what's going on there. But I think I think it's a cool way to uh, you know find gaps in your data. So. <laughs> That was nice. Also, uh, just a comment, like, have you used Plotly here? No, I have not. Uh, okay. So I guess using Plotly helps simplify like this exploration process very easily. So using Plotly is actually is very simple. You just pass a ggplot object into it. Uh -huh. And then it gives you, uh, you know, you can easily zoom in or zoom out at a particular location. Oh, really? So you don't need to, you know, manually change chord cartesian and anything else. Oh wow, that is. Do you, do you wanna? It has a function, no? Sorry, sorry. No. Like you cannot add the subtitle and you cannot format the subtitle and all using Plotly. That's what I have faced. But yeah, for exploration, it's good enough. 
Yeah, if you hover over the points, it will give you exact yeah. value as well. So for price as Correct. well, you'll get the exact value where the x-axis ends or something like that. Yeah, so it's useful. Can we can we quickly try uh, doing a plotly thing? Sure. So if you could load library plotly. Oh, I don't. I don't think I have it. I do have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and basically, uh, I guess the above graph, right? Uh, yes, before uh, chord partition. Oh, uh, okay. Not done. The before one. So you can wrap everything into ggplotly. So at diamonds, you just write before diamonds on line 72. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is correct. Yeah. No, no, that is fine. 70. Uh -huh. yeah. And just yeah, put this in that function. Yeah, run this. Oh, wow. Okay. Now uh -huh. you can hover over the points. It will give you the values uh -huh. and oh. select a square, something like that. Try to select so it can zoom in basically. Drag, drag and yeah. Oh, I see. Wow. This is amazing. How do I zoom out? I think there is return button or home, home. You see that home icon there? Nope. Yeah, this. Nope. I think ninth one. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Reset. But, uh, why? Okay, let me. Set the bin width a little smaller so that we can see that gap. All right, so now we have that gap. I see. Well, this is actually this. if you see there are values in there are in that gap, but there are. the count is very low. Yeah, there are. You're right. Yeah. Count there is this sixty six with a price of fifteen hundred, yeah. which is really cool. Okay, let's let's. Uh, I'm sorry, this is this is super interesting. Uh, let me do fifty as I did in that lower graph. Uh, so we have yeah we have fourteen fifty, we have fifteen fifty and above. Yeah, this is absolutely zero. This is absolutely blank, right? Very interesting. Is 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 that all that we need? That we can uh, is uh, the functionality of GG uh, Plotly or uh, no? There... Actually, Plotly has its own uh, syntax and graph. There are a lot of things which you can do, but uh, yes, as Aditi <laughs> mentioned, that there are certain things which do not, you know map basically from ggplotly uh, from okay. ggplot to plotly so okay. we have to take care of that maybe but for such simple cases we can use that right mostly i prefer to do everything in ggplot mm. whatever i want and then just call ggplotly like this how we have done here yeah 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 that makes there sense are many other things as well that you can do yeah this is this is super interesting thanks for sharing yeah, this this makes this is this is perfectly suited for I think uh, data exploration. You can you can play around with yeah. it a lot. A lot. Yeah, it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, shall we move on, or do we do we have other other thoughts, other comments? Um, okay. Okay. Uh, so the next question was, uh, how many diamonds are 0.99 carat? How many are one carat? What do you think is the cause of the difference? Okay. Uh, so since the question is interested in, uh, you know, learning between 0.99 and one, I thought having a bin width of 0.1 might be uh, useful. So when we do that, uh, we can look at, you know, what's 0.99 and 0.1. And uh, we can use uh, uh, 
coordinate Cartesian to limit the x-axis. So this tells us that, you know, there are, oh, actually 0.99 and one, right? We should actually do point, uh, an even smaller bin width. Uh, 0 0.01 maybe? Uh-huh. And now I'm gonna apply my newly learned ggplotly skills to use. So yeah, this is where we are at. And the question now is about, uh, you know, what is happening at 0.99 versus uh, 0 0.10 and why there is such a difference. So I think this is 0 0.99 and we see that there are only 23 diamonds uh, in 0.99. And then there are like 1500 uh, or diamonds with a carat value of one. Uh, not really sure why uh, the, there's such a huge difference, but I think uh, one explanation could be uh, the rounding off. So, so most of the carat values, if we see, uh, start, so there's a huge peak at, uh, you know, whole numbers and uh, subsequent uh, peaks can also be observed uh, in, uh, you know, rounded off numbers. So, uh, for example, 0. 0.5 will have a higher value, point, I don't know, uh, yeah, it kind of basically decreases from there. So the first uh, peak that we observe is, uh, at 0.5 and then this next peak that we observe is at 0.7. Uh, the next peak is at 0.9. So at each like 0.1 uh, kind of a difference, we see a, a spike and then it kind of declines uh, from that point on. So I think it's it's it has got something to do with, you know, whole numbers and fractions. That might be a reason that we do not have a lot of carrots that are 0 0.99, but a lot of carrots that are 0 0.1. So that's the only explanation that I can think of. Any other uh, possible explanations for this? Uh, yeah, even I did not understand that. So yeah. we can ask Blue person. Uh, I, I don't know. I just background check so what i understood is uh one carat diamonds are a lot more cheaper than 0 0.99 actually in the market oh wow uh so that's why people prefer to buy one carat actually there's no much difference visually between 0 0.9 and carat and one carat mm -hmm. but people buy one carat more so that mm -hmm. is a cheaper than 0 0.99 so that that is why it is like this okay that's what i figured oh wow that's interesting yeah, why why buy a point nine nine when you can buy a one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the difference is very very minimal, but uh, yeah, one carat is more cheaper. So, got it. Okay, very interesting. Um, next we have uh, the last question for this exercise is the is to compare and contrast between the chord underscore Cartesian function versus the x limit or y limit function that that comes with ggplot. Uh, when we want to zoom in on a histogram. Uh, so that's the first part of this question. Let's, let's see what happens. Uh, so here uh, I'm using, uh, I'm, I'm writing two very similar codes. One uh, with uh, uh, using the Cartesian coordinate function uh, and setting the limit at uh, the X limit at one, 1000 to 2000. And this is what we get. Uh, and the second, for the second uh, bit, uh, we are using everything else is the same. The only difference is that we are using the X limit function and applying the same uh, limits of uh, 1000 to 2000. Uh, so what we observe is that the, uh, when we use the X limits, it's removing the uh, rows or the observations that do not fit our uh, limits. So anything, below 1000 and anything uh, above 2000 would be removed by uh, the function. And that's how uh, X limit works. 
However, and and that is uh, that can also be seen in the uh, y axis. So when we used x uh, limit, the the maximum value for the y axis is seven fifty. Uh, however, when we used uh, the Cartesian coordinate, the highest value was thousand, a little more than the, than a thousand, which means that it's re it's kind of retaining all the uh, values. It's just not showing everything uh, on our map, or it's just showing thousand to two thousand range. Uh, but not removing anything. Uh, whereas uh, when we used x limits, it's actually removing cases and reporting only the uh, the, the values that have a x axis of that that falls within our range. Uh, so that was interesting. Uh, I'm not. I, I mean, I, I can't think of uh, you know when we would want to use one over the other. But it's it's certainly good to know the uh, the nuanced differences between. Uh, Cartesian coordinate and x limits, and maybe we'll we'll need to choose one over the other in some use case. So, yeah, that was the first part of the question. The second part was, <clears throat> what happens if you leave uh, bin width uh, unset? So, uh, in histogram, we were always setting a bin width. Uh, what happens when we uh, leave it uh, blank? Uh, so, what happens? It it runs, uh, but but what happens is that uh, it uses uh, the default number of bins to be 30. So it has, it creates 30 bins by dividing the entire range of the X axis by 30. So, uh, so the bin that we have here is would roughly be uh, equal to 20,000 by 30, which is 666. So, uh, so this is, this is exactly what we uh, uh, get when we do not, uh, use a uh, bin width and finally it says what happens if you try and zoom so only half a bar shows i i could not figure out what this meant uh was does does anyone any, any, anyone know what what do we mean by half a bar by any chance I'm not sure. Does it mean that we need to change the x link values? Hmm. So the highest bar, which is the first bar, only half of it will show. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But which, which, okay. Yeah, the highest bar. Okay. Yeah, that could be one possible. Uh, uh, X limb or Y limb? And how do uh, we get yeah. at Y limb? Y limb, yeah. But how do we get at the half? Like five thousand? <laughs> I don't know. I guess we work. need uh, Y limb, right? Oh no. Uh, Yeah, this is showing half of, <laughs> it was 10,000, we, we curtailed it pretty much. But then, yeah, that's, I don't know if this is what they're looking for. But yeah, that was the last bit for uh, that exercise. They have a chat. Uh, Abhimanyu says, is, is it half in the vertical? Yeah, exactly. Half in the vertical or horizontal? Yeah, we're not sure. Uh, yeah, hori yeah, horizontal could also be the case. I mean, they might be looking for, you know, for us to display only half of the, only the first half of the prices, maybe. In which case we will do a X limit as Ronak was suggesting earlier. So we'll... Do an X limb till only whatever five thousand ten thousand yeah yeah either either ways but applying limits definitely seems like the way to go either either vertical or horizontal yeah uh. So that was the first exercise. Uh, then we 
uh, move on to the next section in the chapter, which talks about missing values. And uh, there are different ways uh, to tackle missing values uh, that the authors uh, mention. Uh, the first not recommended way is to uh, you know filter it out uh, by dropping the entire rows uh, using the filter function. Uh, the second uh, way that the authors talk about is to create a new variable uh, using mutate and then using something like a if else within the mutate uh, line to convert any unusual values or any outliers into NA values. So that's, uh, that's another way, which is definitely uh, useful. Uh, this is an important section here where uh, uh, we talk about how ggplot uh, is also, uh, also subscribes to the missing values philosophy, by which they mean that if there are any if you're trying to plot, uh, you know, two variables and one of them has certain observations which are missing, uh, ggplot would uh, automatically uh, ignore those uh, missing values and consider only the values where all the variables are available. Uh, and we also have a na.rm or na.remove equal true function uh, within uh, ggplot, which we can use to, you know, avoid uh, this, this type of a warning. So that is, uh, that was interesting. Uh, we move to the second exercise, which was really short. Uh, the first one is what happens to missing values in a histogram? Uh, what happens to a missing value in a bar chart and why is there a difference? So uh, let's try both of them. Uh, so for, the, for, for viewing the histogram, we uh, use the flights uh, data set that we were working with last week and uh, we are trying to plot uh, air, the you know air time uh, as a continuous variable uh, as a histogram so when we do that uh, we see that uh, you know r removes 9000 rows uh, which are uh, nas uh, this is good now we want to compare and contrast that with what happens uh, with geom underscore bar. For geom underscore bar, we use the diamonds uh, data set first. This data set does not have any missing values. So I create a new variable for cut and, you know, say that if any price is less than 350, then convert that into an NA. Otherwise, keep it as the same original value. And then I try to plot a geom underscore bar. And here again, we see that. Uh, the plot removes the 17 uh, NA values that, that were generated by this line. So I'm not sure what the difference is because both the plots uh, kind of remove the NA values while uh, generating the plot. Uh, so not, not sure what, what is the, what would be the difference between these two. Any ideas? They seem to be working quite the same. This also has 17 NA values. Um, this had 9,000 values which were removed. Any thoughts, anyone? Okay. Uh, let's move on. Uh, the next part of the chapter is about uh, covariation. Uh, so how two variables uh, vary with each other. And uh, so, uh, so far, we have been looking at distributions or how a variable uh, kind of varies within itself. And now we'll be looking at, you know, we'll be contrasting two different variables and see how they vary with each other. Uh, the first section is uh, a use case where one variable is a categorical variable and the second variable is a continuous variable. Uh, 
the chapter starts with the, I mean, goes back to the geom underscore freak poly function that we saw a little while ago. And uh, uh, says that it's a good way to, you know, uh, visualize things when we have one continuous variable, which is price right here. And the other one is a categorical variable, for example, cut. So uh, this kind of generates a frequency distribution of uh, the number of uh, the number of observations uh, at each price point for each of these cuts. So the yellow line, for example, is uh, uh, represents ideal uh, cut of diamonds, uh, and it shows a distribution of the prices uh, for that particular cut. And uh, the green one uh, is about premium. The, the lighter green one is, is for very good. Uh, the disadvantage with using this method is that uh, this distribution will uh, vary substantially if one of these subgroups has a very high number of cases. For example, when we do a, when we look at a distribution of the number of cuts, we see, see that a lot of diamonds or, or, or quite a few diamonds are ideal and very few diamonds are fair. And that is why uh, when we look at the frequency poly uh, graph, we see that uh, fair is like has, uh, fair has a really low uh, distribution, whereas ideal has a really high distribution, uh, which is nothing but the which is nothing but a representation of the number of cases of those uh, uh, pertaining to those types of diamonds. So this this might uh, mislead. Uh, us while we are interpreting our data and uh, an alternate to this is to use uh, the density function instead of the count function. So uh, density kind of standardizes that count and uh, uh, in, in, in uh, that kind of a plot, we are, not, we are then comparing the area under the uh, polygon. So uh, as we can see, uh, they used uh, x equals price, y equals density, and then did a geom frequency plot, which created uh, which created a very comparable uh, graph across different types of cuts. Uh, so that is one way of looking at uh, you know covariates when one of them is continuous and one of them is uh, categorical. Another more standard way, of course, is to use box plots, where uh, you know, uh, it reports the intra quartile range, it reports the median, it shows uh, the first quartile, the third quartile, and it often it also shows the uh, outliers. So that is, uh, that is more or less about uh, this uh, section right here. Uh, the authors also mention that there's a way to reorder uh, the different categories that we use in the X uh, axis. For example, uh, this graph right here uh, is uh, a box plot of uh, highway mileage across the class of the car. And it's uh, arranged quite haphazardly. And if you want to arrange it by, uh, you know, the highway mileage, we just need to say that, okay, the value of X is reorder class and reorder it by highway and use the function median. So this now arranges the, the, all the box plots in a increasing order of uh, the median values of the highway uh, mileages for each value of, um, for, for each category of uh, class. And finally, there's another function called uh, uh, quad underscore flip, which flips the uh, uh, axes uh, from, I mean, if you want to uh, make them horizontal instead of vertical, so we can do that using quad underscore flip. Mm. That is it. Uh, yeah, so uh, the first one was. Uh, hmm. So the first uh, question here was uh, use what you have learned to improve the visualization of the departure times of cancelled versus non-cancelled flights. Uh, let me actually go back to the cancelled versus non-cancelled flights example. Yeah.
yeah right here so uh, earlier in the chapter the authors used this as an example where uh, they created they wanted to compare uh, the departure times for cancelled versus non cancelled flights and uh, what happens in this case so they so they create a new variable using mutate uh, to identify flights that are uh, cancelled uh, through a true or false way through a logical variable and uh, when they do a frequency polygraph for the same thing uh, we we see that you know the number of cancelled flights are very few uh and the number of non cancelled flights are very high and that's why uh the distribution of scheduled departure time is not that useful uh we can address this by uh using the density function so instead of uh using counts as the y axis we use density as the y axis and uh this makes the two uh the cancelled and the non cancelled flights very comparable uh and then we can see you know uh when uh, so for example we see that there's a there's a lot going on here when the scheduled departure time increases uh the cancellation kind of increases so maybe towards the later parts of the day more flights are being cancelled so if if we are if we are uh, planning our flight maybe it's better to uh book our flights you know early in the morning where the chances of delay or chances of cancelling a flight are are relatively less uh yeah so that was the first part uh the second question here was uh actually i'm still working on the second question so uh can we can we uh pause this today and uh take up the i mean from the second question onwards uh, in the next uh, session yeah sure i think that would work arna okay thanks so we have like three more exercises so we covered three exercises and i think there are three left so so that should be good any thoughts on what we discussed so far anything that that you might want that you would do differently or or any any other suggestions all right so let's wrap up for today and uh, meet next week again sure uh, i'm sorry i didn't hear but i think abhi manyu has a question was that resolved no abhi manyu can you uh, is is uh, was your question about the vertical or horizontal limits Alvi, do you know if if there was some other question apart from the vertical or, or horizontal uh, limits? No, 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 no other questions. Okay, yeah, yeah, we we did discuss that. Okay. So yeah, so I think uh, let's meet next week then. Sure. Thank you so much. Sure. and uh, we also want to uh, talk about the next few chapters on who's who's leading which one uh i think uh, minakshi will be doing 8th and 10th awesome. uh, if i am not wrong so awesome yeah